All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to another PCC forum. Thanks for the slack, Sean. Um, <laughs> I, I always cut him some slack. <laughs> As do I, you. Yeah, sorry, no. Well, um, glad you all made it out tonight. Uh, we are very lucky to have our own professor, Sean Kelly, with us tonight. Uh, Sean has been with PCC since 1997 and is currently the, uh, the chair of the department. And tonight he's going to speak to us about ethics, uh, the sources of the good towards a complex integral ethic for the planetary era. Um, whenever you do philosophy, but especially when you do ethics, it's important that the person speaking to you is, is virtuous. Uh, and <laughs> vir <laughs> virtue is an aspiration, certainly, and not, not, a, not a possession, just like wisdom is an aspiration and not a possession, unless you're Hegel. Um, but that's another story. Um, but lucky for us, uh, Sean has uh, one of the warmest hearts that um, I have ever uh, uh, been privileged to meet and also one of the sharpest, quickest minds. Um, and the, uh, the synergy between his heart and his mind, I think all of you would agree with me, is, uh, is profound. There's a constant circulation between his understanding uh, and, and his care for uh, his students and for his community. And uh, I very much uh, look forward to uh, what you have to share with us, uh, your insights about ethics in the planetary era uh, tonight. I should also mention that Sean is the author of two really uh, uh, wonderful books. Uh, what was his dissertation and then later published, uh, Individuation in the Absolute, Hegel, Jung, and the Path Towards Wholeness. Um, a really wonderful synthesis of, of these two thinkers, Hegel and Jung. Despite Jung's uh, distaste for Hegel, Sean perceived that there was actually a deep uh, um, congruence to their fundamental uh, ideas. And then more recently, uh, Coming Home, The Birth and Transformation of the Planetary Era, a sort of grand uh, historical overview of the trajectory of uh, uh, the evolution of consciousness in the West. Um, really great uh, book, really for understanding uh, from the, the largest uh, uh, perspective what PCC is all about. I think there's all of it's pretty much in here. Um, so please join me in giving a, a warm welcome to our own Sean Kelly. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That's, that's a lovely, sweet introduction. Thank God. Totally in character, I may say. And I'll just set myself up here again. Okay, I think this will go here. All right, thank you all for, for coming. Um, as I was telling uh, uh, Yuka and Rick and Yvonne, <coughs> uh, I'm sort of inviting, I'm inviting you into my workshop tonight. Uh, these ideas, I've been working on them. I've been working with this particular, I guess it's a paper at this point, it's a paper or it might be a monograph in progress. Uh, I'm maybe a third of the way through in terms of formal writing. Um, I have lots and lots of notes. I gave a version of it as a talk recently at the last Integral Theory conference. Um, <clears throat> and I was very nervous because Edgar Morin was in the front seat <laughs> watching me the whole time. <laughs> sort, of <clears throat> sort of how I felt when I first came to PCC. The first time I taught here, Rick was in the first row <laughs> with his notebook. <laughs> <laughs> Taking notes and learning. Oh, I know, I know, but I didn't know. I thought it was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so I'm hoping that, you know, knowing many of you here, we can we can get into some uh, rich and helpful discussion, which will help me uh, give further shape to to these ideas as we go along. So I'm not going to read a paper. You, you'll be happy to know, but I will occasionally read some passages to you. And I thought I would begin just with the first paragraph of the paper since it does, since it does um, set the scene in a way, I think in a, in a pretty good way. So if you'll allow me to read this one paragraph. Uh, in one form or another, and to varying degrees, 
the burden of ethical choices has weighed on human consciousness from its inception. In the last few years, however, the burden has tipped all previous scales as the consequences of our actions take on the weight of the planet itself, or at least that of the entire Earth community, whose fate now lies largely in our hands. Or perhaps our minds or consciousness as much as our hands, since our actions are expressions of mental, psychic, and spiritual choices. These choices started assuming planetary proportions about 500 years ago, when, through the voyages of conquest and discovery, humans first circumnavigated the globe, establishing stable and continuous intercontinental exchanges and communications. This was followed soon after by the Copernican Revolution, around which uh, we have learned and continue to learn so much from, from Rick, <clears throat> uh, which revealed that the Earth is indeed a planet, a wanderer, planetes in the Greek, like the other planets, and not the static center of the medieval universe. Over the next few centuries, the modern scientific, industrial, and political revolutions would deconstruct and disenchant this universe. The project of modernity has liberated nations, raised the quality of life for billions of people, and has birthed scientific and technological wonders. At the same time, in our own time, Modern industrial growth society has created a state of global apartheid with incalculable human suffering, has initiated a mass extinction of species, and brought the biosphere itself to the brink of collapse. Though the planetary era began five centuries ago, by all reasonable accounts, we now have a decade at most to make the right choices, for there to, ha for there to be even a chance of avoiding what seems like an inevitable planetary catastrophe. The nature of the planetary era, therefore, if not explicitly in its beginnings, now reveals itself as ethical to the core. Okay. So that's by way of introduction. <clears throat> um, so hopefully it's self-evident. I'm not sure that that needs any further commentary. But I will add uh, two very brief uh, quotations to start with, one uh, from uh, Edgar Morin and one from Ken Wilber. It's a very brief one from Edgar Morin. Never before, he writes, in the history of humanity have the responsibilities of thinking weighed so heavily on us. Okay, never before in the history of humanity have the responsibilities of thinking weighed so heavily on us. Uh, as we'll see uh, shortly, we have to unpack what's meant by thinking. It's not thinking in, in, in uh, the way that many people might normally understand the word. Then finally, um, these two sentences, or is it one? Yeah, two sentences from uh, uh, Ken Wilber. The ecological crisis, or Gaia's main problem, is not pollution, toxic dumping, ozone depletion, or any such. Gaia's main problem is that not enough human beings have developed to the post-conventional, world-centric, global levels of consciousness, wherein they will automatically be moved to care for the global commons. Okay, so. Now, why uh, Wilbur and Morin? <clears throat> um, I actually encountered both of these figures at about the same time, I think, yeah, and halfway through my uh, doctoral studies in the uh, early 1980s. Um, and I was struck by both of them for uh, similar reasons. Uh, at the time, and still, but especially at the time, I realized how, how much I didn't know. I mean, I still realize how much I didn't know. But I've come to terms with the fact that it'll always be, uh, It'll always be the case. But at the time, especially as a doctoral student, when one feels the responsibility of, of knowing what needs to be known, especially if you're going to call yourself a doctor, and realizing just how little I knew, and in fact, how impossible it would be ever to uh, read, not everything, but even read what I thought an educated person should have read uh, to be where I wanted to be. I encountered these two people, Ken Wilber and Edgar Morin, each of whom give you the impression of having uh, 
mastered and being able to hold within their field of, of vision the totality of knowledge, not every single fact, but at least the field, the total field of knowledge from the natural sciences, the social sciences, the human sciences, philosophy, religion, spirituality, psychology, and so on. Uh, so they each gave a way of feeling at home in this otherwise uh, infinite seeming field of knowledge where one could feel disoriented, lost, and, and hopeless, really. So they were, they were a great source of, of inspiration and comfort for me, and still are. Now, <clears throat> as far as Wilbur goes, I, uh, I initially um, swallowed his work whole without much digestion and, and just ran with it for a few years. But after a few years, I started developing a, a more critical uh, critically appreciative relationship to his work, <coughs> where, uh, which, which is how I would characterize it now. I mean, I still deeply appreciate his work, and I'm grateful to him, and continue to be inspired by what he's done. But I do have some some critical uh, issues with his work. Um, Morin's work, um, I don't have as critical a relationship to it, probably because I think his work builds in the moment of self-critique uh, in a way that I don't find. Uh, quite as uh, evident in Wilbur's work. Maybe that'll come out a bit as we go along. However, what they both share in common with respect to this uh, opening paragraph I uh, shared with you also, is uh, they each offer <coughs> a way of thinking about, holding in consciousness in a coherent way, the complex nature of our moment, which is really unparalleled. It's unparalleled for so many reasons. But they do it in very different ways. Now, Wilbur is associated with the word integral, uh, and uh, he didn't start using that term, actually, I'm not sure, I think it was only in the late, maybe it was late 90s, early, early 90s, he started using the term to, to characterize his, uh, his thinking. At first, he characterized himself as a transpersonal psychologist, but now he's, um, he's associated with the idea of integral philosophy. Morin, on the other hand, is associated with the idea of complexity. He doesn't use the word integral, but complexity. But they are, they are both uh, uh, related terms, complementary terms. Okay. This is how I would, how would I characterize the relationship between both of them? Let's see. Well, one way of characterizing it, and this is a, a distinction from Hegel studies, is so two ways of getting at, if this is what we're trying to understand, which let's say is all of reality, the whole of reality, which is represented by an empty circle. There's at least two ways of getting at this. One is to come up with a system, is to uh, describe the systematic structure of the totality, and there's different ways of doing that. Another way is to develop a way, which is what method means, a way of approaching that totality, a way of being at home in it. Okay, so system and method are two aspects uh, that, um, if you think of Hegel, for instance, Hegel has his system of the philosophical sciences where the totality of knowledge is organized uh, structurally in terms of a movement from the logic to the philosophy of nature to the philosophy of spirit, for example. But we also have in Hegel his method, which is associated with the dialectic. Right? So there's, there's a system which is a kind of mental space through which you can organize knowledge. And then there's a method or how you move about that space. Yeah, they're, they're very different approaches. <clears throat> you might liken these two uh, approaches to the, not to equate it with this, but the eye and the ear, the way the eye and the ear work. So the eye looks for a structured totality. The ear listens for how, how things work, right? how things sound. It's the difference between system and method. Now Wilbur is very, very strong on system. For Wilbur, there's a place for everything, and everything is in its place. It's a very, very robust system. Moray doesn't really have a system. 
I mean, you can, you can devise various possibilities for system by reading Morin. But what he does give you uh, is a way of approaching this complex field, this complex moment that we find ourselves in. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why I think it might be useful to put these two figures in dialogue with each other, because they, they each have strengths that the, others, the other doesn't. Uh, and um, we need all the resources we can get at this point in time. Okay, so the topic of what I want to explore with you tonight, bringing in uh, these two figures, these two panoptic thinkers, these two big picture thinkers, uh, Wilbur and Morin, has to do with the question of ethics, ethics in the context of the planetary era. Right? So, uh, ethics. I don't know where you stand with ethics, but when I, when I, when I, when I, when I think of ethics on the one hand, uh, uh, at least traditional philosophical ethics, it can be very, very dry and uh, not that interesting. But if you think of the root of what ethics is about, namely value, what do you value? What do we value? What's good? How do we know what's good? Now that might sound abstract, but actually uh, it's something we do all the time, right? consciously or not. We value certain things, we pursue certain things through desire, we avoid certain things because for various reasons, we're, and we're attracted to other things, we strive. So wherever there's striving or desiring, or on the other hand, wherever there's turning away or aversion, we're dealing with value or good, right? the good. Now, usually these, these movements of going towards or turning away from are done more or less unconsciously. It takes an effort to bring the always present, the, the, the always present uh, action of, of valuing. It takes effort to bring that to consciousness. And <coughs> I, I would maintain that, that we really need to work at bringing that to consciousness because Certainly as a species, as a culture, our actions are literally bringing the planet to its knees. And if, we don't, if we don't bring to consciousness the cumulative effect of our actions, it really seems like not only human civilization, but probably the majority of the world's species will be gone within a century. And the face of the planet changed irrevocably for many, many, many thousands of years. So the only chance we have at maybe averting that is to bring what is normally an unconscious process to the level of consciousness, to become aware of how we are constantly creating value, constantly producing and reproducing value. Now how do we do that? We do it just with every action. We do it with our thinking. And this is where the quote from Morin is so relevant. Never before in the history of humanity has uh, the have the responsibilities of thinking weighed so heavily on us. Now why thinking? What does thinking have to do with values? Well, here you can think of um, I think, uh, Jung, if any of you are aware of Jung's uh, psychology, <coughs> his psychology of the four, the four functions. Actually I'll put thinking here. It's always put on the top. Thinking, feeling, uh, intuition and sensation. How many of you are, are familiar with the four functions of, uh, in Jung's psychology? Okay, it's fairly wide, widespread in the Myers-Briggs test and so on. Now what many people don't realize is that for Jung, <coughs> he said there were two axes. There was a uh, sensing and intuition, he said, is, a, uh, is a, uh, an irrational and perceptual axis. And feeling and thinking is a rational axis. So clearly thinking, we can see why he would associate thinking with reason, but why feeling? <coughs> well, when we, feeling has to do with like or dislike, right? When you value something, you, you put it higher, we might say, or you include it within your circle of that with which you identify your in-group, 
right? That's, that's when you like something, you include it. Similarly, thinking, <coughs> what thinking is, is the putting into motion of categories of inclusion or, and exclusion. A distinction between a subject and an object, between a class and the members of the class, uh, between what we consider to be substantial or essential and what we consider to be accidental. All of these categories of thinking are actually value judgments, or they're inescapably linked with value judgments, with feeling. This is why Jung very wisely saw that thinking and feeling are actually part of, of, of a spectrum, of a, of, a, of a unitary activity that has to do with uh, the action of inclusion and, and exclusion. Okay. Now what that means is that every time we think, every time we make uh, a judgment about what something is, we are actually involved in an ethical judgment. We are making uh, values. Now, you've probably heard the, the idea that all facts are value-laden. In the philosophy of science, this is a very um, uh, important uh, foundation of, the philo of, of modern philosophy of science. Challenging the common, the what mainstream still uh, opinion that there is such a thing as as independent, objectively existing facts on the one hand, and uh, values on the other, or theories, interpretation of those facts. So, in the philosophy of science, we see that um, uh, facts are always informed by theories. All facts come, in a sense, pre-formatted by theories. There's no such thing as a fact that hasn't been, in some way, shaped by a theory. And by a theory, what we mean is by uh, uh, cognitive categories and value judgments, thinking, feeling. Right? So there are no facts that we perceive through our senses that aren't always already, in some way, pre-formatted by uh, this axis here. So the philosophy of science has really, has really done this. Now what this also implies is that the traditional philosophical distinction between theory and, and praxis. Okay, we have theory, which is, uh, you know, we in, here in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness, we really concern ourselves with theory, with worldviews, with uh, philosophical systems, with you know, theories of this and that. Uh, now theory is often contrasted with praxis or action in the world. And usually when we think of ethics or value, we associate it with the praxis side. That to, to uh, concern yourself with ethics or value is to concern, concern yourself with action in the world. But what I want to uh, point out to you here is that uh, all action in the world is always already informed by some kind of theoretical perspective. Right. There is no ethical action in the world that isn't already uh, bringing, that, that, that isn't bringing into being in the world some kind of worldview or theoretical perspective, right? So just as there are no facts without theories, there's no ethical action in the world without theorizing, without thinking, which is why if what we're trying to get at is the right action in the world, we really need to have our thinking uh, straight. Okay, so no praxis without theory, and by the same token, theory itself is a form of praxis. So to think, to theorize properly, is itself an ethical act. So I hope I'm not just trying to justify my my uh, social role as a thinker here, but I, I actually do believe this that um, that thinking. <coughs> Bringing to consciousness the way our mind works is itself an ethical act. It's a form of praxis. It's important. All right. This is all by way of introduction. All right. So the title of the paper I, I propose is Sources of the Good. <clears throat> Some of you might recognize the allusion to Charles Taylor's book, Sources of the Self, uh, a brilliant, deep book which I would not dare to try to uh, summarize here. But um, if, if any of you are interested in high-level theorizing uh, uh, around um, the problem of modernity, the modern self, 
and particularly in relationship to uh, ethics and the history of, of the good. I, I strongly recommend that book. So here, though, I'm talking about sources of the good. So given, <coughs> given our current moment in the planetary era and the, uh, the literally um, planetary imperative of bringing to consciousness our thinking about value and the good. One question will be, well, what are the sources? What might be, the, how can we think of the sources of the good or of value? <clears throat> now, if we ask that question relative to Wilbur and Morin, it turns out that they, they each, uh, they each approach this problem by pointing to uh, three to begin with, but then I would suggest four sources of the good. This is a, a preliminary fashion. And these four sources, uh, I'm going to put them down for you. Well, I keep forgetting that I'm not tied to the, tied to the mic. I can actually move. Okay. Well, Richard. The individual. <coughs> Society. I'm going to put nature in quotation marks because it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a contested term. But for nature, we could think you know, of, uh, as we'll see, uh, uh, cosmos, if you prefer. Or, as I'm going to focus on, uh, also mm, Gaia. Okay. So these are three main sources of the good, or three... <coughs> loci, you might say, places that we, that we can turn to, to try to, to, in asking ourselves this question about where, how, where is the good and value grounded, and how can we ground the good in this current context. Now the fourth source, I'm going to say spirit, which is also a contested term, and we'll see what, what that might mean as we go along. <coughs> now, those of you who know Ken Wilbur will recognize immediately his so-called big three of I, uh, we, and it, which, as you'll see, if the, I, have, I have a problem, especially with this last term, it, uh, or its, but um, in any case, uh, there we have it. <coughs> and spirit, Wilbur, uh, refers to spirit uh, all the time. He also speaks of the transpersonal. So you'll recognize those terms from, uh, from Wilbur, I hope. <clears throat> now, both Wilbur and Morin re uh, recognize that for the largest stretch of, of human history, for the longest period of, uh, of cultural evolution, these three and actually these four terms existed in a state of more or less, you could say, uh, integration or fusion. Uh, Robert Bella, the, the late great uh, sociologist, uh, refers to compact societies. Is that right? Compact? Compact uh, cosmologies. Com it comes from Vogelin. Eric Vogelin, OK. So compact cosmologies. Compact meaning you know, close together. Um, <clears throat> and here, so. Here I would point to, is it all right if I, if I move around, you've got me, okay. So we've got four sources, and here we have three phases. So to begin with, these sources exist in a state of compaction, or we might say, uh, um, well, look at some, what can we say? Part, well, I'm not going to say participation mystique. Well, more or less ident well, not identity. What will I say? Let's say compact. We'll just say compact. Okay, compaction. This is probably the case for if if the if the if we date the origin of our species to you know roughly 200,000 years ago, or even if we talk about the origins of history 5,000 years ago, for the first uh, three 4,000 years of human history up until. Roughly the 6th century BCE, 
we have this condition where individuals exist, certainly, there were always individuals, <clears throat> but there was not a clearly distinguished, differentiated sense of individuals apart from the groups that they were in. And certainly, human societies and cultures, I'm going to put culture here as well. Human societies and cultures were not conceived of or experienced as radically distinct from the cosmos. Right? We can think of uh, indigenous, almost all indigenous cultures, for instance, where uh, the human and the, the cosmic, or the human and the animal, the human and the plant, are uh, seamlessly connected. They're not clearly differentiated. That's true. That was true of all human cultures for the first at least 3,000 years in the historical period, until around uh, the 6th century BCE, or BC, where you get uh, the uh, Axial Age, which I won't really talk, to, talk about now, otherwise we won't get past the first quarter of this paper. <laughs> but um, uh, those of you who don't know, how many of you don't know what the, it's all right, or how many of you know what the Axial Age is? Okay, almost everybody here. Uh, for our purposes, what is uh, significant here especially is, you might say that it, it's the beginning of the differentiation of these four elements in human history. Think, for instance, of the, the origins of Greek philosophy, or think of uh, uh, the emergence of Buddhism, or uh, the Upanishads in India, uh, or of uh, the, the great Jewish prophets in Israel. <coughs> where uh, certain individuals, at least, and the, the social circles in which they lived start having an experience of their own individuality as self-conscious beings able to stand apart from the group and criticize it, for instance, as in the, the Jewish prophets, or uh, to, to have an experience of radical individuality relative to the transcendent. Think of Plato or Socrates and, and the ideas, or the Buddha under the, the bow tree, this experience of enlightenment. So in all of these cases, you have the, the emergence of, of a new kind of individual who stands apart from society uh, and is able to transform that society through their own standing apart. Uh, and in the axial period, it's Universally, a question of the individual establishing a new relationship to spirit, to some kind of realm that is conceived and experienced as existing in a transcendent relationship to everyday reality. Whether it's Plato's ideas, or the Buddhist Dharma, uh, or the special relationship to the law uh, of, uh, of uh, Yahweh, Right? Okay, so we move then from this initial phase of, of compactness of indigenous cultures, where these four terms aren't really differentiated from each other, to the beginning of the differentiation in, in a very clear way. Okay? Now this, this phase lasts up until roughly 1500. I mean, it, it, uh, you can see signs of, of it changing before then, <clears throat> particularly through the, the more or less thousand years from the birth of Christianity preceding the, begin the origins of the planetary era around 1500, in a kind of the incubators of the medieval, um, the medieval, not cloisters, monasteries, the medieval monasteries, where there was a, uh, an intense cultivation of self-reflection, self-reflexivity on the part of the monks that made possible eventually the birth of modern science and so on. Now, <clears throat> from 1500 on, it's not obvious at first, certain processes start to be set in motion, which closer to our time accelerate and sort of go off the chart. And with those accelerating processes of the, the modern period, which is also the beginning of the planetary era, you move from the beginning differentiation of these elements in the second phase to their dissociation. Okay. 
So a movement from differentiation to dissociation, where the individual now stands in, a, in an antagonistic relationship to the group, and where human society and culture now stands in an antagonistic relationship to nature and the cosmos. And uh, where we have basically a kind of war of all against all in many ways. Um, all right, so three phases, but where the second phase has, uh, in a sense, two moments. The second phase is a differentiation phase, but at a certain point in the late modern period, that differentiation turns into a, a dissociation. Okay? Well, here's a little quote that gives you uh, a sense of what I mean. A couple of passages from uh, Wilbur and then Morin. <clears throat> Right. According to Wilbur, the late modern period, dominated by the mechanistic enlightenment paradigm, has seen this differentiation pass over into a pathological dissociation. And with this dissociation, and I quote him, uh, Wilbur now, the great nightmare of scientific materialism was upon us, Whitehead. The night, not, not that Whitehead is a great nightmare <laughs> of scientific materialism, <laughs> but he's, he's referring to Whitehead's uh, um, uh, characterization of the uh, great nightmare of scientific materialism, the nightmare of one-dimensional man, Marcuse, the disqualified universe, Lewis Mumford, the colonization of art and morals by science, Habermas, the disenchantment of the world, Weber, a nightmare I, Wilbur, have also called Flatland. Okay. Such, uh, Wilbur writes, is the disaster of modernity. Okay. Focusing on the ethical implications of the late modern dissociation among the terms of his own version of the big three for Morin, the individual society and the species for Morin, Morin notes that the traditional sources of the good have dried up. And this is a Morin now. The source in the individual, he writes, is asphyxiated by egocentrism. The communal source is dehydrated by the degradation of solidarities. The social is distorted by the compartmentalization, bureaucrat bureaucratization, <laughs> reads better bureaucratization in French, <laughs> bureaucratization <laughs> and atomization of social life. The bioanthropological source, cosmos, uh, is weakened by the primacy of the individual over the species. The development of individualism has led to nihilism, the anxiety associated with the nostalgia for a lost sense of community, of foundations, of the meaning of life, can entail a return to formal national, ethnic, and or religious communal foundations accompanied by a sense of psychological security and ethical support. Okay, goes on. So, um, what we can say then, uh, some implications here. <clears throat> We haven't really got, we've, we've identified some possible sources of the good. And we realize that these traditional, the, the way that, that the individual and, the, and society and, and society's relationship to nature acted as sources of the good or value in traditional societies uh, has broken down in modernity. And these three terms, actually these four terms, have become dissociated. Morin, Wilbur, and many other writers consider this kind of dissociation to be an evil. So we're already getting at a sense of what the good might involve. If we're trying to get at a, a sort of meta level of what is the good? Okay, well, These are sources of the good, but what is the good? Well, clearly, if the dissociation among these possible sources of the good or grounds of value is evil, then uh, we, we can look for uh, a new, renewed relationship uh, between these traditional sources of the good as being an expression of the good itself. However, uh, what I want to, what I would like to stress is that uh, it's not merely enough to point to the dissociation between these terms as evil. Okay. From an ethical point of view, 
I think it's essential to point out that, uh, in fact, in our own world, the relationship between individuals and other individuals, the relationship within an individual to their own interior complexity, and the relationship between humans and the rest of the Earth community is not only can, uh, should not only be characterized by dissociation, but actually by a relationship of uh, dominance and violence. Okay, now there's a difference between dissociation and dominance or violence. By underlining and acknowledging the dimension of violence and domination that exists between these relationships, between these sources, I should say, uh, I think it's only in, in explicitly acknowledging and focusing on that element of power differential, dominance and violence, that the properly ethical dimension can, can come to light. Okay. So, let me see where I am here. Now, in terms of uh, Wilbur's writing, um, I know you, Jahan, probably have read Up From Eden. Um, have any of you, have anybody here, anybody else here read Wilbur's book, Up From Eden? No? Oh, well, you have, Matt. Okay. Do you remember his idea of exchange distortion in that book? No. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a term that he brought up and used, I think, quite powerfully in that book, and then seems to have more or less abandoned ap after that. Uh, and in it, he, he has this idea that, um, first of all, the individual, he says, should be conceived of as a compound individual, as a sort of complex individual, with different dimensions, different layers. And he, he points to the traditional distinction between, uh, uh, at least in perennial philosophy, between uh, the physical body, the various subtle bodies, let's say the etheric body, uh, the astral body, and so on. Different bodies are sheaths. Uh, that would be the compound individual. But he says that the compound individual always exists in a system of relational exchange with, uh, with his or her environment. So no individual exists in isolation, but is always an individual in relational exchange. So for instance, our physical bodies are constantly taking in food from the environment and excreting uh, ma you know, matter and energy and so on. Our uh, uh, chi body is taking in air, prana, chi, and giving it out. Our mental bodies are taking in information, giving out information, reproducing information, and so on. That's how we exist. Now, he points out in this book um, by uh, bringing together Marx for the level of material exchange. So Marx has a very, in Marx's theory has a very robust uh, theory and understanding of the distortions in, in material exchange. For instance, in our world, uh, where most people work, uh, if, if they've got a job, those who are lucky enough to have a job, they work for a living, and basically they exchange their labor, their time, for money. And the money is always less value than the actual productive value that the person is engaged in. Otherwise, the person who hired you would not be making any profit. Right? So capitalism is based on Marx pointed out the alienation of a person's labor uh, and the accumulation of the, of the um, basically stolen labor as capital. So capitalism is based upon a system of exchange distortion where people are alienated from the fruits of their labor. That's, that's what capitalism is. Now Freud, uh, according to Wilbur, is the master of relational of, of understanding the nature of relational exchange and distortion at the level of uh, sex and emotions. We have this whole theory of the Oedipus complex and psychopathology and so on. Um, and at the level of communication, communicative practice, he appeals to Habermas, Habermas' theory of, of uh, communicative exchange. So I, I think he does a really good job in that early work and I wish he had pursued it. The reason why I bring it up here is I, I think something is lost if we, if we try to characterize the, the evil of our moment 
purely in terms of dissociation. The relationships among us and among the elements of our being are not only dissociated, they exist in a, in a, in a state of distortion where one element of a dyad has a, has a dominating power over the other. Whether it is white over colored in society, men over women in our society, whether it's uh, a certain form of, of thinking, conceptual thinking over analogical think over analogical uh, modes, and so on. Uh, human definitely over the natural world, the rest of the natural world. All of these dyads that we can we can imagine, and this is one of the great insights of somebody like Val Plumwood uh, in her the her general theory of, of domination, uh, where she points to the um, relationship between patriarchal domination, for instance, and a domination of the environment. Wherever we have these dyads, uh, there tends to be a kind of a dominant relationship between one of the pairs over the other. So, if we are wanting to think ethically, and if in a planetary context, when we're looking at the sources of the good, we have recognized the dissociation among these sources. To rise to the ethical moment, we need, we need not only to, I guess just to underline this point, we need to move from, uh, explicitly from, dis from dissociation to uh, domination, oppression. We really need to, I think, go there. Maybe it seems obvious, but it was a kind of revelation to me in, in, in my thinking when I was first preparing this. Please. What do I mean by domination? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, if we think socially, the so-called third world, which is more than half the world's population, is being kept in a state of apartheid where uh, the majority of people on the planet you know, don't have enough to eat, don't have clean water, don't have a safe place to live. And the reason why they don't have that is because the, the culture and society that I was uh, privileged enough to be born in uh, have uh, all of the things that they don't, right? Uh, now, we, especially lately, we, we know with the, <clears throat> the discourse of the 1% that <clears throat> the 1% uh, uh, control the, the material, economic, political, and at all levels assets of the planetary uh, capital and culture, about 40% of it. Now the 1% of the 1%, of course, have the majority of that. Now these are just quantitative ratios. We'd have to look at the actual structures of power differential to see how these things play out. But in other words, where you have a power differential that uh, leads to very real things like uh, lack of, of safety, so go up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So lack of a safe place to live, not enough food or not good enough food, no clean water, no uh, uh, emotional security, no mutual recognition in terms of a group, no self-esteem, and very little opportunity obviously for self-transcendence. I mean, there are exceptions. There are heroic individuals who, who despite these handicaps of not, of not having enough to eat, drink, or a safe place to live, still manage to actualize uh, amazing potentials um, in terms of individual gifts and uh, work out of a sense of uh, relationship to a transcendent um, source of inspiration. So they, they can be not only self-actualizing but self-transcending. It's pretty rare. But it does happen. <clears throat> so wherever we have these power differentials where one side of the dyad uh, gets the benefits, and not only gets the benefits, but where the productive activity of the other side of the dyad produces the conditions for the possibility of the benefits. This is a classic master-slave dialectic that, that, that Hegel was the first one to really point out and that Karl Marx used to, to develop his theory of, of, uh, of uh, you know, Marxism. Is that? That's great. I have great. a decent okay. idea, but that was extremely explanatory. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> right, so once we've identified not only 
the, the dissociation among these elements, but the oppressive power dynamics that exist between and within them. We, we know what needs to happen in order to uh, move to a third, this third phase, which uh, in terms of the evolution of consciousness, Many of you and from PCC will recognize, those, certainly those of you who have read Coming Home or, or uh, Passion of the Western Mind uh, or Cosmos and Psyche or Jung or any number of um, works will recognize the deep structure of this movement here where you, where you go from an initial state of relative non-differentiation through differentiation, in this case pathological dissociation, but then there's the possibility of a new identity, of a new uh, wholeness, which um, obviously we haven't achieved collectively on a planetary scale, but there is the desire that we do so. This is what we're trying to get to. So how do we get to this third phase, which in Wilbur's terms he would uh, describe as a world-centric or even planet-centric ethical position? a world-centric consciousness, planet-centric consciousness. Well, the first step is to start thinking in a way that will allow us to, to see what's going on, right? And there's different possibilities, different ways that we can, we can get at that. We can use Wilbur's system to help us. And uh, I would suggest we really need a, a way of thinking that, uh, that Morin is very, very good at, at helping us uh, develop through which we can navigate the, comp the complexity of the terrain that, uh, that we're, we find ourselves in. As we do that, we will uh, be able to identify not only the, the, the dissociation among elements, but the distortions, the distortions in terms of, of pathological power relations, of domination, exploitation, violence, right? These are the evils, yeah? domination oppression, violence. Can you think of any others? I mean, those are the, like, so much is, is carried in those three. So uh, if, if we now think of what would help us uh, not only identify, but, but um, hopefully move beyond uh, domination, oppression, and violence, then we are in the process of intuiting the good, the ground of the good, which presumably will also help us overcome the dissociation among these elements, begin to reconstitute or constitute for the first time uh, a, uh, a truly human and planetary um, identity. But where do we begin with this? Well, both Wilbur and Morin say we need to begin with the individual, with the I. Now, as... Uh, I'll begin for time. 8.30, okay. Go on for ten. Okay, all right. No, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Well, I'm on. I just finished page one of my four pages of, of, uh, <laughs> of, sch of schematic notes, uh, but I, I, I will rush on. Not rush on, but I, I want to get on to what's I think the more interesting parts. Um, okay, so we need to begin with the individual, but the whole point of these two approaches is, one of the whole point, is to show that there is no individual without the we, and there is no human without the rest of the cosmos. So it's, in a way it's abstract to say that we must begin with the individual, but from a pragmatic point of view it's, it's also true. Since um, it's only individuals who possess a conscience, right? groups do not possess a conscience. Group consciousness, there may be consciousness and groups can do things, can think and, and, and behave, but groups don't have a conscience. Only individuals have a conscience. So uh, there really is a kind of primacy on the need for individual development. Now in um, Wilbur's system, uh, Wilbur identifies three main phases of development. Now, if we're talking about ethical development, he follows uh, Kohlberg and others in identifying the three main phases, pre-conventional development, con ethical or moral development, or thinking, conventional, that's the second phase, and then post-conventional. 
So pre-conventional is basically the, the, uh, the uh, it's not even an ethical position. It's behavior that is motivated purely uh, unconsciously through uh, desire and nothing else. It's more or less narcissistic. You could say that it's egocentric. Conventional morality, conventional ethics, are ethics that are based upon the received values of the community, the group in which you live. Now that can be a good thing or it can be not so good a thing. Um, don't have to give you examples of that. Post-conventional morality <coughs> is a, a morality or an ethical way of, of thinking and being which uh, we s first start to see in the axial phase here where the individual is able to appeal to universal standards of some kind or another. Some intuition or, or ideal that is, is meant to avoid the, the um, dangers of narcissism or of mere groupthink. Okay? Three main phases. Now, Wilbur also identifies different strands of development, different lines of development. For instance, Cognitive development. How many of you have heard of Jean Piaget? Just out of curiosity. Okay. Uh, the classic scholar, the classic thinker uh, and theoretician of cognitive development, going from identifying stages, going from uh, pre-operational to operational to formal operational thinking, for instance. Cognitive development. There is uh, ethical development as a separate line. You could think of interpersonal development as as being its own line. Uh, uh, emotional development, emotional intelligence, for instance, could be its own distinct line. Many different lines we could think of musical ability, artistic ability, uh, empathic ability. If we're thinking of ethical development as its own line, one of the things that uh, researchers have realized is that ethical development, although it's relatively aut autonomous, presupposes a certain level of cognitive development. You can't have, you can't think ethically at a high, at a, at a fully developed level if you can't think at a fully developed level. So ethical development depends upon but, but is, not, is not reducible to cognitive development. Now, uh, let me see here. So ethical development, ethical reflection depends upon cognitive development. However, what I want to suggest here, and this is what we find developed particularly in uh, modern thinking, is that cognitive development itself depends upon ethical development. It's not only the case that, that to be clear about values, you need to be clear in your thinking. You can't think clearly if, you're, if your sense of values are, are out of whack. Now this is something that we already saw with Jung, where thinking and feeling are actually part of the same uh, axis. Let me see if I can give you a couple of little... quotes here. All right, so here's a few little helpful quotes, I think. This is from Wilbur. Role taking, or taking the view of another person, which is essential if you're to be able to act ethically, is something you can only do mentally or cognitively. You can feel your own feelings. You can only feel your own feelings. I disagree with him here actually. I think you can feel other people's feelings. But you can cognitively take the role of others or mentally put yourself in their shoes and then you can feel their feelings or empathize with their point of view. So cognitive development is defined as an increase in the number of others with whom you can identify and an increase in the number of perspectives you can take. Okay, so this is where he's pointing to the dependence of the ethical on the cognitive. If the cognitive develops through 
uh, stages that are increasingly able to assume multiple perspectives, then you can see that ethical behavior, in order to pass from the narcissistic through the, the socially defined to a more universal perspective, is going to depend upon a high enough level of cognitive development. Right? Okay, so that's pretty clear. On the other hand, he says, research continues to suggest that cognitive development is necessary but not sufficient for interpersonal development, which is necessary but not sufficient for moral development, which is necessary but not sufficient for ideas of the good. Okay? Now, then I, I, want, I pass to these few lines from Morin, which starts to show the complex relationship between them here. Everything human includes an element of affect feeling, including rationality. Now we see this particularly in the, the, the work of uh, Damasio. I don't know if you're familiar with Damasio, but he's written several books. The first one uh, that showed very <coughs> compellingly the, the uh, necessary role of uh, feeling, and particularly social, socially modulated feeling, uh, for cognition. That there, there is no, in fact, advanced cognition without, without the, the uh, co-presence of a certain kind of feeling. And he showed this by people who had brain damage uh, in a certain area of the brain which prevented certain feelings from happening and that impaired their cognition uh, accordingly. So Morin says, in, uh, which is supported by Damasio's work, Every, everything human includes an element of affect or feeling, including rationality. Affect intervenes in all aspects of intelligence. Mathematicians are animated by their passion for mathematics. It also interferes through the blinding of intelligence. It animates or misleads thinking, stimulates or obscures consciousness. We now know that every rational act of the mind is accompanied by affect. Though it can immobilize reason, only affect is capable of mobilizing it. Right? Reason and passion can and should correct each other. We can simultaneously reason our passions and passion, passionne our reason. Okay? So, a sub, a sub category here of this thing here would be, uh, he's doing affect or feeling and reason showing the complex relationship between them. Now, I really underestimated how much time this is going to take. Mm -hmm. I really, I apologize. You need to take a little bit longer, Sean, that's fine. Uh, we're well, we're at 8.30, so. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Well, um, I'll just say that uh, one of the key uh, tasks for the further development of the individual for Wilbur is the development of what he calls vision logic. And vision logic involves this kind of linking of affect and reason, of different lines of, of development, the cognitive with the interpersonal, the, the mental with the somatic, uh, the conceptual with the symbolic, or the abstract with the imaginal, right? these different modes of cognition and of consciousness which tend to, to uh, pursue different paths and actually in our dominant culture, uh, in, our, in our mainstream culture, most adults tend to develop one at the price of the other. Usually it's reason or val we tend to value in our culture reason over effect, 
uh, a certain kind of abstract thinking over a more uh, feeling-toned value of thinking, uh, and so on. Vision logic is a higher order thinking where these different competencies, you could think of Jung's four functions, start to work in, in a more harmonious and integrated way. Actually, this would probably be the, the most helpful way of thinking of vision logic for, for uh, Wilbur's vision logic. You could relate very meaningfully to Jung's idea of reintegrating uh, the four functions of consciousness. And not only the four functions, but if you, if you remember for Jung, um, the ego, if this is the ego, or the, individu the focus of individual <coughs> consciousness. The ego is always in relationship to its own shadow, its own unconscious, right? Vision logic as a form of, of integrated, more integral cognition would involve not only bringing these four functions and other developmental lines into some kind of dialogue with each other, but must involve bringing the individual ego into a more conscious relationship with the unconscious, with the shadow in Jungian terms. And Wilbur's uh, does explicitly speak of the shadow and the need to integrate the shadow in many of his works. Moray doesn't use the Jungian terminology of shadow. He doesn't so much come out of the psychodynamic stream in the way that the earlier Wilbur did. But Moray does talk about the need for a psychic culture the developing of a psychic culture, and particularly for uh, developing the habit of self-critique, of, of um, we might say, cultivating a kind of witness consciousness that is especially vigilant for uh, the tendency to self-delusion and uh, self-deception. Right. He, it, um, Every so often, Morin has published a book. One of his early books was called Self-Critique, Autocritique, where he started looking at his, his uh, intellectual and personal development up to that date um, and sharing where he had gone wrong, you know, where his thinking had gone wrong. And he's just, so he's always vigilant about uh, the need, always vigilant to the fact that the individual is constantly in danger of being deceived by oneself more than anyone else. Okay. So we can, we can counter the tendency towards self-deception by uh, developing this form of psychic culture and self-critique, which I think you know, must include the psychodynamic dimension of what Jung would call shadow work. And to the extent that we, we start to build a more conscious relationship with the shadow, we are starting to reintegrate the I, the individual, uh, who is now in a better position to start making uh, truly ethical choices, right? I hope you can see the direction I'm wanting to go with this reconstitution of the I. Now, <coughs> Jung, I'm going to stick to Jung here because he's the one who really pointed this out in a big way. Um, To the extent that we're unconscious of the shadow, we tend to project it onto others. Okay. Uh, and in fact, most of the time, I won't ex present company accept it, uh, but I won't accept myself. Even uh, most of the, most of the time, I would say that my experience of the other is probably colored by is initially presented to me. Uh, strongly determined by an unconsciousness of what's going on inside me. Whether it's, uh, you know, some fear. Or it's usually it's a fear or it's an unacknowledged desire. In other words, it's an unconscious ethical act or potentially ethical act. If you're desiring something or if you're avoiding something, that's the basis of valuing, right? So if I'm unconscious of why I'm or the extent to which I'm avoiding something, or that I'm drawn to something, well, that's, that's the shadow. 
and it's also uh, an unconscious, potentially ethical act, and it has ethical consequences. Right? You're certainly not the only person. Sorry? You're certainly not the only person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, so, you see how important shadow work is for ethics. To the extent that we start becoming conscious of the inner other, the shadow is really the inner other. You know, it's, it's the part of us, of ourselves, that we're not normally conscious of. To the extent that we're unconscious of that, it tends to appear or color our experience of the outer other. So you can see that as we um, do this, uh, develop this habit of psychic culture, including shadow work, we start to, to overcome this uh, dissociation between self and the external other, and, and therefore start to reconstitute the we, or the collective, on a new, on a new basis, where we're actually uh, now capable of genuine, authentic relationships between individuals. We're not dealing just with projections, in other words. Okay, so we've passed to the we. I have a lot that I could say about the we, <coughs> from both uh, uh, Wilbur and uh, Morin's perspective, but again, if we're thinking of ethics, we'd want to be particularly sensitive to the degree to which our relationships to the other uh, are determined by, by power dynamics. Right? And by that I mean where one of the, of the people in relationship is benefiting from an inequality of power particularly benefiting from an inequality of power that is dependent upon the creative activity of the other person. Whether that's, you know, they're growing the food that you eat, they're making the bed you sleep in, they are, whatever. They are recognizing you as a great person. All of these things that the other is doing uh, for you, to the extent that you're benefiting from it, and that is because you uh, occupy the position of superior power and privilege, that's what we need to be sensitive to in our actual relationship to the other. Okay. So we're going from I to we. Now we need, we need to expand that beginning with our intimate relations, most importantly to begin with, especially in our relationships to those who have the least power, children. Right. So if you're a parent or in your relationship to children, this is where it all begins. This is how we create narcissists, as we know, is by, is by uh, uh, not relating to, the, to the, the young other as a true other, but as a mere projection of our own unconscious needs. And that's how we create narcissists and probably uh, catalyze sociopaths. So we, we need to do that to begin with in the families, and then our early childhood education, in our social relations. It needs to spread out that way. So we'd see it reflected in our education, K through uh, parenting and, and uh, through, through university education. See it in the curricula and so on. Obviously we'd see it in our governance structures, our civil society, the way our local communities would be organized, our politics. And this would bring us to the question of, of a truly participatory democracy. Um, only a few minutes left. I want to say the most important. I haven't gotten to. Uh, all right. So, I hope you can see where I'd be going here. As we expand our uh, circle of um, inclusion in terms of the we, we would recognize that uh, that there is no human society apart from the Earth community. That's becoming extremely obvious now since uh, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, and so on, uh, is being threatened. So that if we, if we don't uh, succeed in expanding our sense of, of identity and community to embrace the entire Earth community, human culture and society will collapse. So that, that shows us that the distinction between uh, the human, we, and or society and nature, uh, although there is a distinction, there's no absolute difference. And in fact, um, there's a, a relation of mutual dependence between these two. Which, to the extent that 
this level of participation in the Earth community is a kind of absolute for us. It's not a question only of my own individual survival and flourishing, but of the survival of each and every one of us and of the, the entire Earth community. There is an ultimate concern to that level of participation. Now, ultimate concern, whenever we're dealing with ultimate concern, we're dealing with spirit. You can see I'm trying to get to the last term here. <laughs> trying, trying to bring it all home. Uh, there's a na there's a, an inevitable <coughs> uh, an inevitable opening to the question of spirit or ultimate concern, absolute value. Uh, Moray and Wilbur have different approaches to the question of spirit. They each share a suspicion of uh, traditional mythic identities, but they have very different um, uh, directions that they go in, as you as you know if you have read any of their, their works. Um, but I think what they would both agree on is at least a pragmatic need to uh, focus on what Morin calls uh, the concrete universal. See, we're not going to be able to agree among the various cultures and societies as to what is the, the, um, the most adequate incarnation of our highest value, you know, whether it's Allah or Yahweh or you know, whatever god or goddess uh, we choose to pick. There are just too many of them, and it's unlikely that we're going to achieve a universal consensus in terms of, of traditional um, incarnations of the highest value. But we can all agree that, that short of that highest, epiphany. We all share a common life and death destiny as members of this Earth community of Gaia. Right? So in that sense, Gaia, if not an absolute universal, is a concrete universal. And this is where I think we would need um, to at least have a pragmatic, consensual agreement to, to uh, focus at that level. Um, I have too much. Maybe I'll just end it there, and uh, if there is uh, more that needs to come out or could come out, it can come out in our dialogue. All right? Thanks. Okay. I think everything will be picked up anyway. Happy, happy to paraphrase or repeat. Rick? Uh, just crystal clear and deep. Uh, uh, really splendid presentation. And, um, uh, the one thing, I mean, I can see how you could unpack so many more things in here. And I, I think maybe I'll, I'll just go to just, the, just one thing that I think uh, because it's built right. It, I'm, I want to link two things that you said mm. that shine a different light on um, the categories there. And I think it may respond to a certain um, discomfort that you yourself expressed with the categories. And that is, in your, in your crucial move, I think, uh, in uh, recognizing that the problem isn't just dissociation, it's, it's, it's domination. Right. And the domination can take all those different forms of you know, like violence, oppression, you can, uh, corruption, mm. colonization of the soul uh, of, of, of another culture, etc. All, all sorts of ways it could express itself. It seems to me that that um, the I, we, it um, categorizing builds in a certain act of domination and even violence to the it. It's it by making nature into uh, nature cosmos that are into an it rather than a thou, mm. an o I, an o we. Mm. It's built in. There, the the objectification is there, and as long as that's one of the big three. There's a fundamental flaw of ethics uh, that's built into the ontology, and there's a hidden shadow mm -hmm. that, uh, in that schema, is 
without contextualizing the noble aspiration for um, Wilbur's you know, uh, ethical move to a truly uh, global sensitivity. I completely agree. <coughs> so uh, I, I don't know if so I picked it up. Oh, it came through? Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. I can see it. Great. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That, um, <clears throat> so uh, Moray's version of the three terms uh, are usually individual, society, and species. Sometimes they'll say universal, uh, sorry, individual, society, or culture. He'll sometimes use society, sometimes culture. And then the third term, instead of species, he'll say cosmos, uh, sometimes nature. Uh, but you're right. To say that it's it, or it's, he is, uh, I think Wilbur is positioning himself within uh, this latter dissociation. Uh, and, and I agree with you that um, the whole point, as, as you know, uh, in, in Thomas Berry's wonderful phrase, is to move from a, an experience of the world as a collection of objects, or it's, to that uh, of a communion of subjects, or thou. You know. Or a, or a communion of eyes, uh, and the relationship between an eye and a thou. I completely agree with you. And this is. Um, uh, it seemed like it was just your, your whole talk was pregnant with that. Uh, yeah, it was, and I, it, you're right. And I. I um, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's actually, yeah, it's the other side. You're right. It's the other side. <laughs> S side two of page three. The problem with its. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, certainly we could talk about an objective state of affairs. Uh, and the, I can see the virtue of objectivity and of, uh, of a quasi or provisionally objective stance toward, toward whatever it is we're studying for certain purposes. I mean, there is a certain virtue to objectivity, put it that way. But yeah, to, but to characterize <coughs> uh, nature as it is deeply problematic, I agree. Well, and the way you're using the word objectivity, you're using the word objectivity in a, I think, an ethically noble way, which is to see the other as it is and not as uh, one might be projecting um, uh, a distortion onto it. Mm. But the problem, uh, with um, the it is that there is built in a distortion of it, there is a projection of in a sense one's own mm, uh, shadow soullessness onto the other rather than taking the other as being a genuine um, you can you can be objective by being truly objective, you see the other as a subject. Exactly. And that's the, that's the, that's the built-in distortion of the it. That's right. <clears throat> now, to be fair to Wilbur, I think he, he does recognize that in, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, what, what has to happen for the I. So he, he talks about moving from third person to second person to first person, uh, where you know, third person is basically it. Uh, we see certain behaviors and we, 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 we consider that these behaviors or things are out there, third person. The first stage is to see that uh, they, they are, they're mine, somehow related to me, and then finally to integrate them as part of the I, as first person. So he, he sees that, that sort of three, that movement, he, in typically Wilbur fashion, going in you know, three, two, one. To summarize the shadow work, the nature of shadow work is to convert uh, from third person to second person to first person perspective. Um, but and is that in relationship to human beings or to the cosmos as a whole? He doesn't do it to the cosmos as a whole. Well, yeah. I mean, he, he would in the sense of, of, of uh, eventually realizing that all of manifestation, all of nature and so on, is a manifestation of, of, sure. this, uh, of, of the great spirit. self or the great spirit or so on. But in his model, um, at least here where you have, uh, you know, it and its, and then we and I, that's how he yeah. sort of does the, the four quadrants. It's problematic. It, it, it's, he's situating his model within what Gebser would call deficient mental hyperperspectival consciousness. You know, that's one way of characterizing it. And it's unfortunate uh, because uh, he, he needn't do that. But uh, he's done that, so I, yeah. Well, he wouldn't have had the 
particular type of brilliance he had that drove him to do what he did if he somehow hadn't had, I think, those constraints on his psychology that got in the way of, of this insight. But, mm. um, we don't have to unpack it more. You, you, I, I, I totally get that you get it. Good, but thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Thank, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember who else. Richard? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Sean. It's always such an um, adventure to listen to you speak. Mm. And, uh, thank you, Richard. Complex and deep and beautiful. And um, I, have a, I have a question that's more of a feeling than, than a direct logical thought. Um, for once, it's connected to my reflecting on the three stages that you have there, from the compact to the axial age to uh, perhaps the, the birthing of the integral and the unfortunate darkness and, um, of, of the phase of dissociation. Um, what I'm curious is, is was, it, was it a necessary event that um, such a sh shadow version had to, had to come to light? in the development of um, individual consciousness. Was it, was it necessary for individual consciousness to be birthed the way it exists today, to dissociate from the three other sources of the good that you mentioned that are connected to society, nature, and spirit? Um, in, my, in my heart, I would believe that it wasn't necessary, but I see that, that, this is, that is certainly the state that we are existing um, in. And um, a different way of looking at it, and I'm curious if, if Wilbur or Moran account for the possibility that there is something inherently good within humanity. Like the, in my own worldview, it would be the, the um, subtle presence of your soul that mm -hmm. could be felt in the compact phase, in mm -hmm. the axial phase, and in the modern phase. Something that allures us to move towards an ethical existence that does not require a progress uh, of further integration, even though that is an aspect of it, but maybe a, a awakening of that sense of an inner goodness of the soul. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 it's difficult for me to, to think about it. I'm, I'm, it's just an intuition. Mm. Um, I feel, for example, that humanity through all its different developments was allured by music perhaps for the last 50,000 years. And that to me accounts for a, a presence of soul that we, we yet have to, have to describe fully. Mm. Um, I certainly want to believe that something within us is, is um, drawing us forth to, to move into an ethical existence that does not require, again, the, 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 the process that is outward, but it is a remembering of something that is within us, perhaps. Mm. Did that come through at all, that uh, Chad, do you think? I so, think so. You think so? Yeah, well, I was so well the, 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 <laughs> do you want to speak to that? Just? No, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, well, the, 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 the first one, I mean, it's a classic question about, <coughs> about the nature of evil. Is, is evil in some sense necessary? Um, who knows, really? I mean, who am I to say? But. Uh, if I had to say, I, I, I would at least say that it seems to have been inevitable. Whether it's necessary, it was inevitable. It's hard for me to imagine there having been a world and its history without the evil of dissociation having entered into it. Certainly if I look back in my own life individually, I cannot imagine in retrospect me having developed without having made these, you know, sometimes very serious bad turns that I did. Uh, it just seems inevitable. Given the finite character of, of, of perception and given the complex and conflicting urges that humans have, um, for me, uh, the evil is inevitable. <clears throat> but if you want, but was it necessary? Is it necessary? Well, then the question is necessary for what? And this is a fascinating question. It, that brings in the, 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 uh, the question, is there a goal? That, is there something that's trying to happen, on a, especially on a planetary scale? And if there is something that's trying to happen on a planetary scale, if there's a telos or a goal, a lure, then the question is, would, is, is this dissociation playing a role 
has it played a role in making in, in making it possible that that goal could come to, to fruition? And um, you know, really what? My question is: Is it really evil, or is it the unconscious manifestation of humanity's shadow? Right. Like in the forging of our autonomy, did we necessarily have to engage with our own shadow dimension of our being? which is being projected, like you're saying, out into the world. Right. Like the disenchanted cosmos, <clears throat> the projection from our own mm -hmm. fear. Great question. I mean, if, if we, if we uh, as, as a possibility, um, imagine that uh, the world as a whole is trying to become conscious of itself. Not everybody would agree with this. But I, I think that this is a plausible hypothesis. It's in fact my own intuition of what is the case, but that's just my intuition. I also think it's a plausible hypothesis. We could give arguments and evidence to support the idea that in some sense the world as a whole, call, call her Gaia, uh, is trying to come to consciousness of herself as Gaia. Now somebody might say that's ridiculous on the one hand, and somebody else might say, what do you mean? Gaia's always been conscious. Uh, you know, we're just this little speck on her back. Uh, but somewhere in the middle, between those who would deny any self-consciousness to the earth at all and those who would consider Gaia to have been always conscious as all the gods and gods are conscious. I would propose that maybe you know, the, the, the earth system, if you want to speak in scientific terms, the biosphere even, uh, as, a, as a single um, organismic entity, uh, has the potential to awaken to itself, to become self-conscious. Now, presumably, to my mind, that would happen through human beings. Why? Because human beings are not other than the biosphere. We are part of the biosphere. We just happen to be, as Teilhard said, that part of the biosphere that awakens to itself through the noosphere, through, through the, the subtler level of consciousness. Right? Humans, humans are just biotic stuff, material, that happen to be complex enough that uh, the life itself becomes conscious of itself as life. Right? That's, what the, that's what the human part of the biosphere is. So if that's what we are, um, it it, what we know is that within these last 500 years, we have become aware that we are planetary beings. Humans didn't know that five, before 500 years ago. And we didn't know it. Well, we, we, we can only know it once we had physically gone around it, and, and actually uh, there were people alive on, ev on every continent who could hold within their consciousness the fact that there are people on all the continents. Right? That, that was something new, like a very, at first very, very thin and fragile fabric of the noosphere started to be woven 500 years ago, which in our time, as we know, through our smartphones and everything, I mean, just like call you and I call it, text each other from you know, Kyoto to, to here. And, uh, so we're, we're all immediately connected to each other, and we all know through uh, ecological interdependence, financial, economic interdependence, uh, and now you know, technological interdependence, how connected we are as, as, as a species and with the planet. So it seems that indeed the planet is awakening to itself as a planet through us. The irony is that that doesn't, that now whether it could have happened without rapacious capitalism, colonialism, and uh, uh, industrial devastation, technological domination of the planet, who knows? But it didn't happen that way, right? It, it could have, you, you'd think, like 2,000 years, let's see, when was it? Yeah, 2,000 years ago, human beings were on every continent of the planet. In fact, 15,000 years ago, human beings had, had spread to every continent on the planet. This continent was the last one to have human, human beings reach it by foot across the Bering Straits for the first time about 15,000, maybe 20,000 years ago, but probably about 15,000 years ago. South From, including South America? Including South America. South America. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, so this continent, yeah, the, the Americas. Uh, about 15, so starting 15,000 years ago, there were people on every, con human beings on every continent of the planet. Of course, we didn't know that. I mean, the people alive then weren't aware of the others. Right? Uh, what needed to happen 
for that planetary consciousness to emerge? Well, you, you, needed the tech, you need the Copernican revolution and the industrial revolution that followed from it. You needed the, the capitalist revolution and colonialism. In other words, you, needed, you seem to have needed these evils. Or, another way of thinking of it is that the planetary goal that was struggling to realize itself it, uh, if it didn't need them, it made use of those to realize its own goals. So, could it have happened without them? Maybe. We just don't, you know, we, haven't, we don't have another Earth to repeat the experiment. All that we know is that, at least on this planet, this is the way it happened. Uh, so, the, the evil was used to make, at least partially, to make that happen. Is that enough to redeem the evil? Maybe in retrospect. It's not enough to keep the evil going now. Like once we realize, okay, oh, I see that. It's like in my own life. I can see that, all right, I can, I can forgive myself certain things in the past and see that, all right, that's where I was and it, it was necessary for me to have had that experience and do that in order for me to become who I am now. But now that I am who I am, <laughs> I don't have the same excuse anymore to do the things I did then, right? So there's an ethical imperative as I, as I bring to consciousness the way the past has contributed to who I am now. Well, similarly, as a species, as a culture, we're at that point, I think, of, of ethical, uh, raising to the consciousness an ethical imperative of, of basically of this a global metanoia, uh, a, a, a switching of our consciousness, a conversion of consciousness, where we identify the oppression, the, you know, Metanoia, the other word for metanoia is revolution, right? So conversion of consciousness, revolution, social revolution. It ha it, there, there's an ethical imperative for revolution, you might say. I don't know that. Josh? Um, you brought up apartheid, mm. and um, I think you said half? Well, it's more than half, actually of the world's population, depending on, you know, how, how we're going to define, um, like, relative to the 1%, the 99% are, are in a state of, in a sense, apartheid. But um, you can cut the pie differently. You can think of, the, of the, the first world, but, so we're in the first world, right? But there are parts of Oakland and, and little parts of San Francisco and so on that are basically third world. Like there, there are classes of people, there are neighborhoods, uh, there are little pockets within the first world that are basically third world. Yeah. So it depends on where, where you're going to cut it, uh, what, what sort of resolution our gaze takes. Uh, yeah, but that's, that leads right, perfectly right into the question, because it seems like there's a collapse in that kind of revolution, in, in, in this, there's, a, there's a sort of collapse. Um, whether someone doesn't have their basic needs met now, um, it's, it's collapsing in time because, um, you know, if, if, if we don't have some sort of big shift, whether someone dies in a year or 15 years ago, it, 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 it's, it's collapsing. And that's a difficult thing to, to take in. Um, um, and I, I don't know what it means, but it starts to say something different. It starts to um, tell a story about a, a whole planet. Um, because we have this potential energy, this trajectory that you know, might get disrupted or it might continue. Um, so to really take in that potential energy, I mean, I, I even um, people who have their basic needs met, it's, it's collapsing. What is the it that's collapsing? Um, well, the capacity for this planet to sustain life. Oh, oh. So, so are you saying that, the, that even it's those... It's a subjective perspective right. mm -hmm. on even the people that have their subjective needs met. Right. Um, I, this is kind of an extreme example, but um, I, I thought of there was a guy like probably a year ago or something, a police officer in LA who went a little crazy. 
Um, and then one of my friends said, well, sh Uranus, Pluto, um, you know, people who are really working in this system and are part of it are, are wounded in a different way. Um, and sometimes the pressures of um, all the energy right now can, can pop and even on this rampage. And, so I think if I, if I understand what you're saying, um, that you know, each of us individually carry the other within us. Right? Yeah. So, so, mm, so uh, and even those who have all of their needs being met, for instance, like the 1%. That story seems to be wrong. Yeah, and I think if we, if we looked at the 1% the, the, whose material needs and, and self-esteem needs seem to be being met, if we could actually see, if they could actually see that it's, it's happening on, on, on the backs uh, or it's happening at the expense of, of these others on... Their on grandchildren. A, what? <laughs> of their grandchildren. Oh, well, their own grandchildren too. So, I mean, the classic example is, is uh, Scrooge, right? In, in A Christmas Carol where, where he has this vision of, oh my God, he starts to see the other and, and have, see that the other is actually himself, that he is the other and that his his well-being depends on the other. Now, <clears throat> um, we're starting to see this on a, on a bigger scale in terms of the nature-human relation, that, that there is no human civilization without a biosphere, without, without uh, the atmosphere in, in a certain state, and without biodiversity and so on. So we're seeing that civilization is, is dependent. Civilization which we have uh, treated as a master and the biosphere or nature as the slave, just to revert to Hegel's master-slave dialectic. Up until recently, uh, civilization has acted as though it's the master, nature is the slave. Now, Hegel shows brilliantly in this chapter of the Phenomenology of Spirit how um, the, the unconsciousness of the master is that in fact the master, he, is actually dependent on the productive activity of the slave. Uh, and to the extent that the slave starts to realize, hey, I may be a slave, but I'm doing all the work here. Right? <laughs> and, and I actually have this creative relation of, 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 of productivity with the natural environment uh, upon which the master is dependent. Mm. And so the slave awakens to uh, her uh, authentic productive activity as the master eventually awakens to the fact that, oh my God, I'm dependent on the slave. So the, the, the slave becomes master in a sense and, and through the revolution and, and the master is, is toppled and overturned, right? That's in the master-slave dialectic. <clears throat> well, we're, we're sort of coming to that position collectively, at least many of us, with regard to human civilization or culture and nature. But we're, it's harder to get to that perspective, I, I find. It's, it's harder for me to come to terms with the fact that um, uh, you know, the vast majority of humans are living in a state of, of uh, deprivation relative to my life. You know, I don't know when the last time I, I, I get, occasionally get hungry, but it's not, you know, it's no big deal. I'm hungry because I, I haven't filled my stomach for the third time uh, in a day, and I, you know, I, my blood sugar is getting low, sort of thing. But, um, yeah, <laughs> watch out. Yeah, uh, but when I, jeez, it's, put it this way, it's a lot easier for me to, to, take, in, uh, to take in the more abstract level of, of uh, human domination of the biosphere and work at that level than it is to take in the fact of the enormous human suffering going on. And not only in terms of, um, at all levels. That, that to me is harder to deal with. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because it's closer to home. It's the human other who is who I am, and um, so, for instance, the the, the field of, of uh, uh, social ecology is is a really interesting field. It it brings together uh, the the um, uh, it shows the intimate relationship between domination of the environment and and uh, desecration of the environment on the one hand, and domination of of other human beings and how it's. It's particularly the human beings on the, the uh, dominated side of the power relation who are the ones to suffer the consequences of the de degraded environments, right? This is eco-social justice. 
Drew Dellinger, our, P our recent doctor in the PCC program, is, is doing a wonderful job in, in showing how in Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, great contributions to our world, these two sides of the ecological and social justice are intimately related. They're part of the same complex. I'm not sure how we got at this, but um, yeah, so it depends on your perspective, whether, whether how these things are related. And, and we need to, to broaden and complexify our perspective and get used to, to uh, thinking both systematically in terms of the big picture, but also more subtly in our thinking uh, uh, in the way that Morin, I think, can really help us do, so that we don't get caught in simplifications and, and reifications, mistaking maps for the territory and reproducing some of these power dominant, these, um, uh, uh, reproducing some of these pathological habits of mind, like conceiving of nature as an it, um, without wanting to. So Morin can help us more in, in, in that direction. Jessica. Um, just speaking about ethical imperatives, mm. it um, really draws my attention to the ethical imperative of everyone being able to narrate their own subjective experience and the intelligence in those stories that come particularly from the oppressed mm. because when you're discussing this relationship between master and slave, it turns out that the master is very disassociative, this evil, and that the slave is working the land. Mm. And when you work the land, you're in a deep connection with yourself and the world around you. And that inherently um, creates a context where you're experiencing wisdom mm. firsthand because you're living in in the world um, through in, with your body and your emotions, and it's you know it's it's not just with um, these abstractions that sometimes thinking can mm -hmm. um, tend towards. And so it seems that the key to um, you know humanity's future, making it through this unprecedented ecological crisis, lies within the voices that have been silenced, and that it's it seems that it's. It's through the space between us and the relationships that we can c cultivate that aren't based upon domination, but actually um, can only be born out of tremendous vulnerability and care and deep listening to the other, that it, it turns out that there's these unimaginable new ways of being in the world, these, these methods um, and, these sy and, the, and, and systems that um, seem to be able to get us out of this trap that that we've, you know, the trickster and all of us has put ourselves in, which mm. is, it's, it's, it's in a very erotic trap. I mean, there's nothing like death to get you excited about life. And so there, it's by no means to pathologize where we've come from, but it also seems that we can't continue to, let, and it seems this is what you're pointing to, to fall into these same systems and, and methods of relating um, because it's what's got us to where we're at. And so... I'm not exactly sure what I'm saying right now, but something about um, being able to hear the voices that have been silenced, which actually means that we have to be able to start to find our um, values and measures of what's worthy it actually has to fundamentally shift in a very core way that probably can't shift from the people who are already in power because their measure and model of what's valuable is actually um, s killing the planet. So how do we go about actually being able to hear the voices that are silenced and, f and, and allowing those who have felt unsafe to feel safe enough to actually start speaking their truths because it turns out that they're, in, they're actually the ones that are in deep connection with the world around them and turn out not to be disassociative as those mm. that are in power. Mm. Great question. Mm. Well, we'll hear the voices from below that come up through protest and... and, and revolution and often violence. And we'll also hear <clears throat> from those at the top who can take on, who can take the part of the other. So I think there's a real role uh, among the elite, which is us, who have the, uh, the possibility and the privilege of taking the part of the other. So you see how Martin Luther King Jr., to take his example again, who, who, who although came from a, a, um, an oppressed, uh, uh, class and well, race it's a problem, problematic cat category but as a black, as an African American he was under the white 
Uh, however, he had enough privilege and through his education and, and the, the other um, gifts that were in his environment to be able to take the role of, of, of the other. Right? And he encouraged, encouraged us. So through his example, Gandhi, a you know, fairly privileged uh, uh, history and position in his own class, uh, was able to take the part of the oppressed other. So in other words, those who can take the part of the oppressed other mm. right, are, are called to do so. Mm. Those who, despite the oppressed relation, the, the oppressed conditions that they're in, have uh, enough uh, strength and, and calling to challenge the um, mm. dominance of, of the other will do so. Now, whether, whether these two can meet uh, creatively uh, in time to make a difference, who knows. But uh, presumably that's what has to happen. I think, Matt, you had your hand up. Mm -hmm. um, so this question is, I think, um, timely and it's difficult. I struggle with how to move forward. Um, so you, you were mentioning that what is really called for is a transformation at the individual level. To begin with. To begin with, in order to bring about a social change in our and our a change in our relationship to to Gaia, um, but as Wilbur points out, um, the way that individual development is distributed across the planet, uh, there's a certain stratification. There are fewer people at higher stages of development and more people at the lower stages of development. And one of the tools that the individual has invented through society to govern is the state. And, uh, you know, like right now, we have a president in office in the United States who um, is, is now going to begin, I, I was just reading today, to use the Environmental Protection Agency to unilaterally impose certain restrictions on carbon emissions and so on, mm -hmm. bypassing Congress. Mm. Um, and as, you know, Obama's coming from a place of very high moral development, recognizing the severity of the ecological crisis. And so he's gonna, without um, the widespread support of society, he's gonna start imposing these restrictions. Mm -hmm. And that's already leading to, and will continue to lead to a reaction from um, those- Vested interests. Vested interests. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I guess what my question is, uh, is do we have time to wait for individuals to develop to the point where these sorts of restrictions upon economic activity and industrial activity would, would sort of arise naturally from the desire of the populace. Do mm. we have time to wait for that? Or do we need this sort of top-down imposition of the few who have achieved that moral development? And if we do allow that top-down that top down imposition, does that risk a reaction uh, from the populace at large that mm. could then bring us even further from the goal we're trying to achieve? <laughs> I'd say yes to all, all of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, uh, I, I, first of all, I would have nicely articulated the, the complexity of these relations. Mm. Um, and, and just one quick thing. <coughs> Those, those individuals who might have achieved a certain, I hate to use the word level, but a certain quality of, of consciousness uh, and personal integration. Obama, you, you mentioned Obama. We assume, at least in your characterization, he's an individual who has achieved a certain quality of ethical reflection. Now, he also happens to find himself in, in, a, in a position of unparalleled power so that uh, his decisions could have major implications. Um, the implication is that, right, the individual's actions are, are going to have some kind of effect on the collective, depending upon where, they, where they're situated. But as Morin points out, with this idea of the ecology of action, we can never be certain what those consequences will be. And, and in fact, uh, the more complex the system, in this case society, or we, but not only society, it's actually Gaia, the more complex the system is, the more uncertain the consequences of any 
individual action. And that, that's particularly true of somebody uh, at the top who's trying to direct things. Like, see what happened with Gorbachev. Okay? So nobody, actually nobody except Morin in his book on the USSR, foresaw uh, several years before 1989 that the Soviet, that the, the Soviet Union was going to uh, collapse. It seemed, it seemed impervious. And yet, uh, this one individual, Gorbachev, by initiating uh, Glasnost and, and Perestroika, the, these uh, policy changes from the top, catalyzed a chain reaction, and, and within you know, a couple of years, this totalitarian complex collapsed. So completely unforeseen consequences from these actions of an individual at the top. This is an example of the ecology of action. So we, we can't tell, and yet uh, we must act because we are always acting. So there is an ethical imperative for people in positions of power, I think, to, to do their best, as I presumably, hopefully, Obama is doing, just as we all have our own imperative from wherever we're situated to act in such a way that we think will lead to the, the, the desired goal. Keeping in mind, though, that our actions are always subject to the ecology of action, so we need to be vigilant to, the, to what is going on. It's like you let, you let an animal out of the cage and you see where it runs, and depending upon where it goes and how it interacts, you, you change your behavior uh, if you're trying to get it to go somewhere, right? So, so we need to be constantly uh, involved in a process of feedback by staying engaged with the consequences of our actions. And I think you're pointing to that need. I realize we're already over time. Uh, is there, but you know, if there's somebody who, who, uh, who hadn't, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.